You know there are times where you have to bet on yourself, where you have to just go out on a ledge and say, hey, I'm not waiting on a door to open. I'm not waiting on opportunity. I'm not waiting on someone to grant permission. I'd rather ask for forgiveness later, but I'm gonna bet on myself. And this conversation today is about one who did just that. Her motto that I love so much says, there wasn't a door, so I built one. Um, I'm talking to J.P. Haynes, also I call her Jana. I've known her about that. Um, I met her many years ago when her uh, she had a production that was on tour, uh, Selma, uh, the musical, The Untold Stories. Wonderful, wonderful production. She's the CEO of ICT, uh, ICTV. Um, I want to make sure you download it, stream it. Uh, there's so much great content that you can get there, but she is one that did not wait on opportunities to come from different uh, media moguls or different people to say, hey, I'm gonna give you, bring you into the room. She said, I'm not waiting on the room. <laughs> I build my own room. I build my own door and invite you in to see what I've created. It might not be what you did, but I'm gonna go ahead and create my own lane. So all of you all uh, who are in that space there that you say, hey, I've waited on this person, I've waited on that, and that promise or uh, this particular um, uh, favor was supposed to come through and it never did and I'm just sitting here idly waiting. No, I want you to listen to this conversation today and, and finally, when you get to the end of this conversation today, say, you know what, I, I think I'm gonna build my own door too. I think I'm gonna build my own platform. Doesn't mean you don't uh, appreciate uh, the other opportunities and stuff that's given, but if you're gonna do anything, you're gonna own your own stuff before anybody else gives you an opportunity first to say, hey, I was this first. Thank you for uh, congratulating or, a con or or I thank you for confirming what I already was, but I believed in me first. <laughs> so this conversation is great. Go ahead and tell your friends, tell your cousins, tell your aunties, your uncles, tell everybody to stream in today because this is a conversation uh, that you'll want to hear. Let's go into it right now. Hey everybody and um, you all got the introduction so y'all know who I'm talking to. I consider her family. Um, she uh, came into my life just a few years ago um, by way of supporting one of her many, many, many babies and many, many projects that she has. But I'm so happy that she is connected with us today. So hello, hello, and how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am good. I'm good. good. Let me tell you something. You are making boss moves. I mean, oh, you man. are doing an incredible job. I want you to know um, I'm sure you've already been written about in some article, 40 under 40, you know, so um, so I guess you have probably been written about and get all types of awards and stuff, you know, but um, I'm so grateful for what it is you're doing. And I want to ask you about that. Like, what do you believe moved you to start creating in the midst of COVID? I mean, you were creating before then, but it feels, it seems as if, it thrust you forward even more, you know, during COVID, you know, and when everything else was shutting down, you were gearing up, you know, so what shifted you to even get into that? I think COVID itself, listen, Kentucky was one of the last, it's, it was the second to last show we performed. We were, you know, that was February of, of the top of 2020. We were in Lexington. We went, left Lexington to Mississippi, did that show. We're headed, headed back to Montgomery to, to go back on stage. And then March hits and I send everybody home and I'm like, okay, guys, we'll take a two week break and then we'll be back, right? Nobody knew what was coming and we're still in the midst of COVID, but nobody knew at the time what was coming. And I had a couple of cast members who were married and with children. So I was like, you guys go home and recalibrate, you know, get with your families. Um, those of us who are, you know, single and such will stay here and we'll prepare for mid-March a relaunch. And that was March of 2020. And, you know, here we are. <laughs> and we, we're still waiting to put this, the show back on the stage. So I went through this period of, what do I do? We had been on tour with Selma, the musical, for three years, not consistently, but off and on. 
And that was our revenue stream. It was our stream of income for myself, my business, my company, the cat, like, you know, we did not anticipate such a hard pivot. Um, So I began creating by way of necessity at first. I was like, man, what are we going to do? I started looking into streaming. I started, you know, we put some analytics together. We put numbers together and we looked at the numbers and we're like, Yo, Netflix is killing the game. <laughs> so, like, what do we have? What do we have um, as people of color? What do we have, you know, as a culture? And, you know, there's BT Plus and other things, but I saw an opportunity for a lane. So I was like, we got to do, we got to figure something else out. So that's your, really where it was born. Your line that you have on mostly everything, um, has resonated so with me that I want to create a shirt with it on there. But when you said that there wasn't a door, so we created one. So we created Um, one, yeah. What is it that you feel maybe in the way you were raised or the people that you were surrounded with that, because there are many people who see doors and they don't move forward because they see a door, some people. And then there are some people who don't see a door. As you said, we didn't see a door, so we built one. There are some people who don't see a door because they don't see it. They're like, well, that means it's not for me. I'm not supposed to do anything. So they sure. stop. What is it that you feel, not just with COVID and all this stuff, because you said in the midst of what some people were shutting down and complaining about what they couldn't do and how they couldn't do the different things, not just this time, but over and over and over again, there's been something in you that has said, you know what? I'm not going to wait for anybody else to give me an opportunity. I'm not going to wait for anybody else um, to show me how I'm going to just go to go ahead and do it. What is it that has gotten you to that point that you're just like, I'm going to do this? I think real intentionality and understanding what you were created for. When you know what you're created to do and what you're meant to be, navigating those spaces, although it's not easy at all by any stretch, to build or birth anything. It's a whole other conversation. But um, I think intrinsically, I have this innate by any means necessary. My admin and I were talking a couple of weeks ago and she was like, you would have done really well in, in old Hollywood. Meaning like back in the day, you know how they used to drive across the country just to get like comedians just to get on stage for five minutes or to stand outside to, to get to the temptations or to get to whatever. And it was that old school, you know, guerrilla hustle grind mentality of by any means necessary, I have to get to this next place. And we live in a place and, you know, we live in a world of social media that's, that's evolved and that's not to be critical, but it's evolved the way people are able to gain exposure. And for me, it's just that old school, I think like, yo, by any, like we have to get this done. I know what I see. I know the vision that I have. I know what I heard. I know what I've been called to. So, okay, the door's not there, but I know I'm called here. So either I'm going to stand here and wait for somebody else to build the door. We're going to get a hammer and nails and we're going to put this door up. Well, see, you keep saying you're circling back to some of the same common themes, calling uh, what I've been created to do. Uh, I know why I'm here. Um, When did you know? Oh, and that's such a made, that's a loaded question. But so when did loaded. you know? It's loaded with so many bullets. Because um, before we push record, you said something that I'm going to circle back to. So I'm going to let you go ahead and prepare your, your message. Uh, because <laughs> before we push record, you said that when I was talking to you about why um, in this particular platform that we're using, um, that I'm being very intentional just about having just relational conversations that are not just necessarily uh, maybe church conversations, but just regular conversations, because uh, sometimes those are the only conversations we know how to have. And you said, because the church oftentimes, and, and we mean well, pigeonholes yeah. people and puts them into certain categories of which we're not able to uh, move beyond. So I'm saying that not just from the standpoint of when did you know this was your lane, but when sometimes, like you said, uh, there wasn't a door, so we built one. When the lane that you're in or called to might not be a lane that you had seen, you know, so when when did you know? Um, 
you know, the truth of the matter is I'm probably still figuring it out. You know, the daily um, battle within yourself, within your mind of, am I, am I supposed to be doing this? Am I called to this? And then the days it is where you know that you know that you know, like they say in the old school church, <laughs> that you know, like you're, you're resolved and you're, you know this is what you're meant for. But I think um, once I really tapped into it, growing up, I, was always, I always wrote, I always wrote poems, I always performed. Um, in college, I would write papers for other people. I never identified writing and creating as a gift, ever, ever, ever. I just thought I was, it was something I was good at. It never registered that it had anything to do with gifting, purpose, create, being created until I was in my 30s. I just turned 38 a few weeks, a few weeks back, but it was I was in my 30s. Like, and I started Selma the Musical and we wrote that. I wrote that and I saw the response. I saw things that I came up with in my brain and put on paper that came alive on stage that resonated with people that I didn't know. And I realized, yo, we're really, we're doing this, you know, and this is something that I'm doing and doing well at a high level. And, you know, I think that's when I started to realize, oh, this is not just something I'm good at. It's something I'm called to, right? It's not something I'm good at. It's something I'm, there's a gifting here. So, um, you know, mind I you, think- Selma is, phenomenal for those of you who are listening or watching this and have not seen Selma of course you can find it on ICTV um or, but I saw it in person um but um that that was all in your head I don't I you know I <laughs> I'd heard one um producer or writer say one time if y'all knew the people that are in my head do you yeah. do you feel like you have conversations of other personalities and people we're not we're not talking about other artists where you have <laughs> you have other personalities that need to be prayed for and dealt with yeah. but do, you, <laughs> do you think you have villages that are in your head of people that you have to silence and- I think as a creator I find a story in everything I don't know that the characters exist until I sit down to create them but there's not a day that goes by whether it's a social media post something I saw on television something I see in passing something I personally deal with that I don't think man that's a genius show concept I mean that would be great for for to turn into a story so um but but for me my my character creation process is a little bit different you know I sit down and that then the person comes to life. And um, so I don't know that I have people in my head per se, but <laughs> I do. I have people in my head. So now I'm I mean, proud we, of them. <laughs> we, I think we all do to an extent, but, but for my character cre- uh, development process is a little different than that, but I get it. I get what he's saying. Trust yeah, me. Yeah. So how do you um, deal with balancing creativity? Because, um, living in a creative space in your head or living in a creative space within your being, your, your makeup and who you are. Um, we oftentimes live in a world that is not here. We live in a whole nother space and paradigms. So how do you balance that uh, with just dealing with people that are um, black and white? Um, they have to see it and see this. And you're like, I'm living in a whole nother place. Sure. It's really difficult. It's, it's really, really difficult because creatives, we tend to, run wild i mean in the abyss of the 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 field and the imagination yeah i'm telling it's you like like uh, so, peter pan's never 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 land it we is always come it is so there's a um you have to teach yourself a level of discipline within your creativity um i just believe that any god-given gift any crap anything that you have instinctively um you owe it to yourself to hone your gift, no matter how naturally great you are vocally or naturally great you are as a public speaker or a writer or whatever, um, you owe it to that gift to develop it and to hone it. So I had to apply the principles of discipline to my creativity so that I could move within multiple worlds because I have to be administrative sometimes. If I have to put my CEO hat on and make sure legal and accounting and programming and 
all of the, the divisions of the network are running and running properly and we have to do checks and balances and numbers and this and that. So I have to go into a space of show running, running the show, being the CEO um, that doesn't afford me to be creative. It doesn't allow me to really like this concept but look at it on paper from a business perspective and realize it doesn't work, but go with my creative side. So there's a, there's a discipline that is required um, to live in, in, wor- in the world with other people where they're not in my creative world, to be able to transition into my creativity. Because if you don't, if you don't let that breathe, it'll suffer and you'll die yeah. in- internally, but then to be able to come over here. So I don't know. It's, it's, um, daily ongoing it's difficult it's probably one of the most difficult things that i deal with honestly you said um that you didn't really start maybe stepping into some of these things until your 30s and i mean of course you say that like it's old but you know i'm i'm come going to die. <laughs> i'm gonna come out of that <laughs> but uh <laughs> what shaped you like growing up like is there an aunt uncle mom dad or whatever that you feel you look at and you're like i'm a little piece of that i'm a little piece of that that grabbed me that shaped me that molded me this 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 school this whatever what can you point to that you feel like these are the things that shape me yeah i think i'm the sum of a lot you know i'm i'm the grand total of a lot of things and a lot of people a lot of experiences i grew up in mississippi i'm a mississippi girl come on yeah, I know yeah. about M I S S I S S I P P I. Yeah, that crook a letter, crook a letter, hump back, it. hump back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, so I grew up in North Mississippi, and um, I was born in the '80s, grew up in the '90s and early 2000s. So um, I have deep Southern roots. I the '80s the are the greatest years. I'm so sorry. I just I, wanted to kind I, of throw listen. That out. I think so. I think I was born at the greatest time. I think my generation, you know, we got to see the the pre, you know, internet, social media blow up. Um, but then we were able to be a part of the transitioning of that yeah. and be be some of the leading minds in, you know, cutting edge everything. Um, so I, I, I agree. I agree. I think the 80s were the best. But um, yeah, I mean, a little bit of everything. I grew up, listen, I grew up in Black Baptist Church. We went Come to church on. every Sunday. We went to Sunday school. Is the old. Come on. That's it. Carry on. That, the old rugged cross. Yeah, that's it. So um, my mother is a strong African, African-American woman. She went from working at Walmart and working in a factory to now being a judge. Uh, my mm-hmm. grandmother worked for, um, she worked her entire life from what I can recall my, my childhood for a white family, raising their children, like ironing their clothes, cleaning their house. She couldn't read very well. So all of those things shaped my viewpoint of being you know, a black woman in Mississippi but what was possible and being able to see the possibilities. Um, my mother demanded excellence, period. There's, there's no conversation. There's no, you know, and she said, t- you're not going to get up there and half do anything. I hear that voice in my head at 13 and 14. So my, I tell my team, our ground floor is excellence. It is not what we're striving to become it is where we start and we grow from there. So, you know, obviously my parents are the most influential, I think, people in, in most children's lives. But just different experiences. I was in Miss Mississippi um, and I competed for a couple of years. I was really, really, really shy throughout my, my younger years. And people wouldn't believe that now because I'm not shy at all. But. I I point to that as one of the things that really changed my life um, because I was forced to step onto a platform and learn how to communicate in a mainstream world, right? In a world where um, I had to dot my I's, cross my T's. I had to speak with proper English and good grammar and I had to be um, presentable to a, you know, a community of people who didn't exactly look like me. And I think that experience really 
taught me how to navigate um, corporate America in a way that allowed me to move forward in other, other instances. So, you know, from my grandmother to, to Miss Mississippi, to my mom, to my, it just various things throughout my life molded me as me. And then I didn't step into my creative until later, but those things allowed me to reach back and be like, okay. So then I was able to put the two worlds together. And now I think, um, some of the success is a result of both of those both of those things working in concert. When I think of when you talk about, um, of course, Baptist and um, Southern, you're talking about in the South, Mississippi. Um, you're talking about deep rooted. Um, you know, Jesus on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yes, um, so that type of faith. How has that? played out for you in um, a platform that does not demand faith or does not call for faith and how you've had to live that out in probably boardrooms and in meetings and in deals and areas that faith is not um, welcomed or even discussed. How has that, um, how have you navigated that? Well, first I had to get a better understanding of who God was. I had to divorce the religion, the religiosity. Hold on, hold on, hold on, (laughs) hold on. Everybody that's watching, everybody that's listening, just take a moment. She said divorce (laughs) religion, divorce it. Just that I just wanted to, I I didn't want to skip over there because you said a whole lot just there. Uh, Look it up at its root. It had to go, you know, and understand, um, the concept of ministry and marketplace and understand like we were talking about earlier kingdom is not just the church and the church is not just a building and and God is most certainly not who many of us have been hoodwinked into thinking he is So I had to get a true understanding of who the God that I serve is and what it meant for me to be a believer um, and what it meant for me to walk in authenticity as a believer and not have to carry a Bible into the boardroom, but still walk in the integrity of what I'm called to in marketplace, but under the glory and the anointing of what God has given me. And be able to balance both of those things and not feel bad for being in a boardroom and not and not feel bad for taking my gift beyond the church and not, you know, so um, and being. Let's talk about that for one moment. Like you said, even beyond, because you and I sounds like we were um, raised in a very similar background um, as it relates to uh, church dynamics. And I think that a lot of. Um, the mentors or leaders that were in the, that particular circle, uh, the faith community, I believe they meant well in pointing us towards the choir or the children's ministry or towards deacons or all those different types of things. But I also believe that it was shaping uh, many of us towards what they were comfortable with or what they had experienced. And it wasn't a level, anything beyond that. Like, I don't remember the small group about how to take your faith into politics, or I don't remember the Sunday school class or any of that about how to take your faith into, as you said, the marketplace or to media or any of those types of things, or how to be, how to be Aretha Franklin singing secular, um, but still have faith. You know, uh, we were oftentimes like they need to come back to the choir and I think about it all the time. There's some, there are some mainstream artists that I don't want in the choir. Like, I don't yeah. think they should have been on the worship team or whatever. Yeah. Like they are called to that lane yeah. and they are shining a light in a way and reaching people that will never step into a church sure. building per se, yeah. but they are having conversations on golf courses and in the the after party after the Oscars that you will never ever be privy to. Um, So 
Um, I just think that that was very important. What you said about how I walked into the boardroom with not a Bible, but my belief. And yeah. I just, you know, just that there, yeah. you know, that that's and, very important. And, you know, we have to, the church has to, we have got to depart from this mindset of condemnation to those who operate in other realms other than the church. The seven spheres of influence, religion is only one of those seven spheres. The kingdom is built of multiple facets and the church is the educational wing of the kingdom, but there are multiple facets to it. And everybody's not called to everything. Some people are, some people have the mantle that they can move across all seven spheres, but we gotta stop condemning people for and stop preventing them from being able to go to the place that they're called. You know, um, I believe God wants us to be in the seven mountains of influence, religion, arts and entertainment, politics, educate, like we, the church is supposed to be called to all of those things. So I really had to get an understanding though for myself. I really had to dig deep and understand and then heal from the self-condemnation and then heal from, you know, what I thought was the nature because I'm over here doing this. So like you said, in the secular world. Um, Would you say that you are meeting or interacting with people now that you would have never interacted with or had conversations with that might um, have what they call, some people say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious oh, yeah. or whatever. Have, are you? Time. Yeah. I'm, I'm always having conversations with people who believe in the universe. And they say, you know, I believe in a higher power and I believe in the universe. And I make, I let everybody know. People say, hey, are you guys faith based network? Is this a faith based network? And I say, not in the traditional sense of what you think faith, faith based is. We're not a faith based network, meaning we only do content based on faith, based on the church, based on religion, based on the Bible. So we're not a faith based network in the traditional sense, but we are based on faith because that's what we do, right? But, but you're going to find secular movies that you, and you're going to find reality shows and documentaries and concerts that aren't all gospel artists. Like, so I know what my personal belief system is and I know what I know got me here. And I'm very, very, very adamant. And I stand on that in every room that I walk in, but I also let them know whatever you believe, I'm not trying to shove anything down your throat. I'm just telling you what my experience is. I love you. I accept you. If we, if the conversation opportunity arises we can talk about it but if not really i let the fruit speak for me and i've reached more people by doing that than ever throwing a bible or a verse or anything else yeah. at. but yeah I, you know in the world of arts and entertainment you find more of that spiritual universe sage you know energy and i'm not you know it's, it's not my job to decide who, who, how where, do you, all that. I want to ask you this. How do you feel that those of us who are on the platform of pulpits or whatever can do a better job of shaping and leading and supporting creatives? You know, uh, it's it's really difficult. It's really difficult because I honestly believe that ministry has a heavy or should have a heavy creative influence, right? Like you look at ministry gifts, whether it's choir or, um, you know, dance ministry, um, plays, you start to see a lot more of that in churches it's always been but you start to see you know your christmas musicals and things like that and that's all a creative influence so other than the the spoken word in the pulpit 
that's your ministry on Sunday, right? Creatives. Yeah. So I think I would like to see um, leaders, church leaders, broaden the world that they create, that they allow creatives to create in for the kingdom. You know, Jesus spoke in parables so that people could understand. Mm -hmm. I think we're supposed to create so that people can understand. And when we lose that ability to reach people in a, in a manner that they understand, you lose the opportunity to minister. So we can tell these stories and it doesn't have to be these and nows and it doesn't have to be. It didn't have to be, ah, ain't he all right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, all yeah that. I know. you know, like it know can be, mean. we can tell these stories. So I think like, I, I, like the message, your, like your stage play with Selma, um, you condensed years of history and years of um, a story, stories, pockets of stories and put it in a, and I could be wrong in the time frame, but like a two hour window, I'm going to say something yeah. like that. And yeah. there was some pockets in that um, display that I myself was like, I didn't know that. Or was that, you know, so basically um, the, the, we are storytelling people yeah. um, that doesn't have to be um, compartmentalized in these um it can be theatric, but it has to be comp it doesn't have to be comp uh, compartmentalized in a, you know, we're going to do this, we'll do that. And then I'm going to say, yeah, three times and we're going to, you know, all that type of stuff. You know, it, it's it's right. broader and bigger than that, because there is a group of people now um, our age and younger who have no connection to any of that at all. At they all. have never stepped foot in any of it. They at don't all. they don't they don't know past me not. They don't know over oh, across. They don't know any of those types of things. So they're interested in something that's greater than them they just don't know what to call it they don't know what to call it and they're looking for people that look like them you know there's a lot of controversy and i don't have an opinion about this but there's a lot of controversy or a lot of conversation around michael todd you know to each their own um but he looks like a, he looks like these this generation you're talking about. They're like, okay, there's a guy who shows me again, whether you agree or not, like that's not really a conversation piece. And I don't, I don't have any, I'm not going to speak on it, but there's a guy who he's, he seems pretty cool. He, he does music. That's not just gospel. Doesn't just feel gospel. Same thing with like pastor Mike jr. You know, like, okay, there's a guy that loves Jesus he seems pretty cool, got a little bit of swag, got some energy. I can get with that, right? Like, so I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like, it's got to be something identifiable tangibly for them so that we can get them to the cross, so that we can get them to Jesus. Well, ultimately, and, the issue is, uh, not the issue, but the thing is, the message never changes. The method by uh, which we deliver it. it changes. You know, yeah. um, we get caught up in, sometimes people get caught up in the wrong conversation uh, yeah. with, I don't like the delivery of it, or I don't like the person who's delivering it, or why are they dressing like that, or why, why are, are they, they wearing yeah. that, or why are they doing all these, it sounds like, you know, church or ministry now seems like it's more personality based, or it seems like it's more theatric or whatever. Sure. all these different things my question to many people is are people's lives being changed yeah are they growing are they being impacted are they talking about jesus i mean are they i mean are they doing something that i mean but okay i mean there's a scripture that talks about yeah one person preaches this way this person what difference does it make if they're yeah. still preaching christ if they're preaching christ then that's all that matters they're, right you know? if they're not altering the message of the cross um yeah, you got you know you got to let people, um, you know, eat from the tables that that they're getting fed from and grow. Um, so I think you know I I just think a more open conversation, um, more acceptance, more allowance 
yeah. is, is necessary. So I don't look like church ever. And I, I don't know if I'll ever look like church. What we do is not ever going to look. I like don't know what, what church is supposed to look like. I think church looks like us. I think yeah. it looks just like there this conversation go. right now. I yeah. think that it, Absolutely. I mean, at the time when Jesus was walking around, it looked like that. It, it looked, looked like, like a fig tree. That's it looked right. like Jesus sandal, you know, all that type of stuff. Sure. You sure. know, now it looks like Instagram, looks like Facebook. It looks like yeah. TikTok. It looks like, you know, all these different things. I mean, that's what it looks like. And it will look different later on, you know, um, but yeah. So you can't get two faith people talking about conversations and it not go off script because this is not I had not at, planned to ask Every you time. any of this type of stuff. And it went Every there. Time. But Every I time. want to ask you, you're a mentor now. So people look at you um, as the go to person. They're looking at you and the things that you're creating and your story, of course, is still being built in your eyes and used to have more beats to accomplish and stuff but how does that feel now like people are now looking at you and asking you questions and like how did you do that and how do you like does that make you feel overwhelmed does it uh, humble you like how how does that feel when people are coming to you and wanting to sit down and ask you and pick your brain okay um yeah there's a level of humility when somebody asks you um for advice for assistance for mentorship for nuggets for you know jewels as they call it <laughs> in this generation um and and what you think is well you know i didn't write the book on this i literally just like we were saying at the beginning of the conversation i'm just figuring out how to build this door you know like there wasn't a manual i tell people all the time i went to youtube university i i watched youtube and podcasts i mean relentlessly to figure out how to write my first script, to figure out what a Broadway script looked like, to figure out how to write music um, for musicals, how to write my first TV script, how to shoot for television, what what the first AD for TV did, what the director does, what's the first AD, what's the second AD, when do you need a second AD, what's a gaffer, what's a grip, when do you need a P? Like, I'm, when I tell you, I just dug in everything I didn't know, I went and found because I didn't have a door. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have people I could ask would take me along the journey. So when people come to me now, I'm like, I don't, I'm not this wise sensei. I'm not this expert, but in people's eyes, I built a measure of success that is tangible and they feel as though they can pull from. So it's really humbling. But I'll tell you what I really found out. I spent a lot of time not to be boastful around different celebrities or different people of notoriety, whether that's in um, some in church, some in television, some in uh, gospel, some in hip hop. And what I've come to figure out is we're all figuring it out. Some of the most notable people the people we look to who stand in the pulpit on Sunday, who sit in a, in a TV studio on Monday, the people that we think are the senseis of the game, they're figuring it out too. Because I sit in rooms and listen, and I'm like, we're not very different. There's not much difference between you and I. You're just a little further in your journey. You figured out some things I've not. So it, it offers me assurance. I rest in that because then I'm like, I belong here. I'm doing the right things. I'm getting to the tables. I'm getting this thing figured out. So you don't have to have it all figured out in order to be impactful. You know, when somebody wants mentorship, you, you give them what you've learned. And I try to give people um, the knowledge that will maybe save them a few steps. And yeah, I just try to do the best that I can there, but, but we're, we're all figuring it out. Everybody. The beautiful thing about what you said, um, is you said when you're in the room, um, with other people that you're realizing that we're all figuring it out. I think the beauty in that to me is the, uh, the village of support that people don't see. I don't believe there are as many haters as we try to give a platform. No. No. We get this platform for everybody hating on me. No, you're hating on yourself. There's a lot of people really want to see, succeed. 
and lots of people want to share what they have. Um, but it's those people who are not in the room, as uh, Hamilton says, in the room where it happens. Uh, and because you're not in the room, you feel um, as if you're left out when every when in reality for you, if you're not in a room, build your own room <laughs> or find a way to get in to do what you need but to get in the room. Yeah. Nobody get in the room. You know, we 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 have the audacious nature of taking um, a microcosm social media and and making allegations, assumptions or presumptions about people in their journey when you have no idea what it took to get to the room. You know, you have no idea what it took for them to get to the table. Imagine living your life under the microscope of social media and your biggest mistakes are highlighted in a world where people take them and twist them and turn them and judge them publicly. And you have to live that life daily. Like, who are we? When do we get into cancel culture, into this world and all of this of, of the court, the high court of judgment of social media and the audacity we have to take food out of people's mouths and, and uh, bully them and um, abuse them, abuse their mental health to a point to where they have to retreat um, because we have an idea about the room they're in or how they got to the room. And we haven't done the due diligence of understanding the journey. We No, we don't have as many haters. People don't have as many haters. And the truth of the matter is, let's be honest, like, what are you doing that people are hating on you so greatly? Like, let's keep it 100, man. Come on. Like, put your head down and focus and get the work done. You may run into some people who not like who you don't vibe with or whose personalities you don't get along with or whatever. But this active energy of we're going to take Mario down, they're not having group meetings you know, until no you know to a certain point on you, it's you just, know, no. you know, so, but we focus so intently on those things and social media has, you know, what I've learned and what I have seen in my own accord. And I'm sure you've seen it when you get into certain rooms, a lot of times people are sitting there saying, I'm so glad you're here too. I'm so and glad you're they're, here. They're looking, they're like, I want it another I want yeah. somebody else yeah. who thinks yeah. like me so I can bounce this off of because as you learn in hiking or anything, which I do not hike, but I've heard <laughs> as you hike or whatever, <laughs> that the higher you get up, the altitude is different. Absolutely. And there's not a lot of people. There are people that as you continue to ascend and go up wherever that mountain is, you know, when people keep talking about, I can't wait to get there, wherever there is, you know, continuing to climb up to whatever you realize that there are more people who stopped and said it wasn't worth it than people who continue to go. Absolutely. So by the time you do get to whatever it is, and, and I believe that the journey um, will take you to many different places, many different peaks, not just one. Some of us are waiting for that one thing and there's many different peaks of which you will have and more valleys than peaks, you know, but there'll be more people that stopped and said it wasn't worth it. It got hot. It was too, it was too hard versus the people who said, you know what, it was hard, but I did it anyway. Right. Um, so when you do get in the room, people are like another person who decided to do it anyway um, and decided to to forge ahead anyway, still figuring it out, but still doing it, you know? So yeah. um, that is to be, um, I think we need to spend more time talking about that um, instead of all of these supposed haters that we can never figure out who they are. Yeah, we like who's who that? They, like who's, who's, who's actively, come on. Yeah, like, we don't, they said, they said, who's they? And usually when you ask yeah, them who they, yeah. they don't have I an mean, answer. Well, you know, I know, I don't know. I don't know who oh, they are. Oh, no, no. Life is full. Life is full of conflict. Life, life is full of people. You know, there's 8 billion people on the earth. Some people just aren't going to mesh. And sometimes it's really simple as, okay, that person's not for me in this part of my journey. They're not hating on you. And, and when you get into that rare air that you're talking about, when you get into those rooms, um, if they're not welcoming, it's typically a reflection on them and not on you. It's an insecure place in them that you trigger, whether it's your confidence or your gift or, or you, you entering the room or your mantle, whatever, 
then you trigger an insecure place in them. And having the emotional intelligence to understand that now that you're in the room, if you've triggered someone there, and then I say if you've triggered, not meaning it's your fault, but if your presence has triggered someone um, to their insecure place, so well now the the reason that they behave in a manner um, or, or they behave in a manner that is unbecoming. So being able to identify that and quote unquote minister to that place, that's the change. Like that's how you really change the game. And you create the alliance of, of what you need in the room. You create what you need in the room. But it, it happens all the time. It happened to me yesterday, yeah. just yesterday, you know, and I'm in a room and, and, and I'm like, hey, honey, it's okay. And I'm not here to, you know what I mean? And it had nothing to do with me. But I didn't need to go be like, man, they hating on your girl again. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it was just. Called. It would have been a tweet. Yeah. You know, but no, I recognized. No, 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 I'm not. It's okay. We can both, we can both reside in this space. It's not a pie. If I take a piece, that doesn't mean there's less for you. We can both reside in this room and both breathe the rare air because that's where we really infect change. That's where the truth of moving forward happens is we are better together every mm -hmm. single time. Very good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. The door of the church is open. Whoever willing, let them. Glory. Uh -huh. I want to ask you a few questions that I did not send you. I want to ask you, what are you, this is called on the spot. It's our on the spot. <laughs> What are you currently binge watching? Oh my gosh. What am I currently binge watching? I don't get to watch a lot of Because you're creating. Of course you can't watch. You're binge watching your own stuff. But uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but um, I, let me tell you this though. You know, being a creative really kind of ruins you sometimes because you, from the it's it's hard to watch things from an entertainment perspective and you're always like oh they should have done this or they could have done this but right now i've been i've been catching up on Grey's anatomy i haven't seen the most recent season and i think it's the season like the covid season where they like tell that story so i've been watching that as i can a little bit so that's that's probably the only thing i think i can recall that i've been watching well, i have a slight confession i've never watched Grace Anatomy ever. Listen, so, I, I had never watched it until a few years ago and I got hooked. I, you know, everybody that back, you watch it, you get hooked. It is. It's really listen, when everybody was on the train, I was like, I'm not watching that just because everybody else was doing it. And I uh, had a car accident a few years ago and I was bedridden for a few weeks. So I watched everything I could and Grace ended up being one of those things and I got I got hooked. Yeah. I got hooked. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll drink the juice too. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I do understand that being a creative and watching stuff and it's very hard for you to. Oh my gosh. You know, doing that. You know, I remember when I was um, um, doing music in college and it was very difficult for me to go to church and hear people sing because yep. we were trained to hear everything. Yep. So every time that soprano that everybody loved or sing and I'd be like, she's sharp. She's sharp. She's off. She's off. She's Why off. can nobody else hear this? You no, know, and everybody's shouting. Yeah. I'm just like, oh. yeah, <laughs> you know, no, I'm dying to blow there. You know, so yeah, I, I <laughs> yeah. get it. I get it. It's the blessing um, and the curse. Yeah. Who can you not wait to meet and at the same time would probably have you stumbling over your words at the same time? Man, oh, I love. Uh, Ava DuVernay and Chanda Rhimes like they I just they seem I've never met them but they seem like dope individuals just in a conversation like this but what they create what they've done what they do as black women man I rock with them heavy I like I, I rock with them heavy so um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to sit down and meet both of them um, you know I think I think for us as as people of color, especially me as a woman, I think Michelle Obama is just kind of one of those like, you know. Yeah. So she'd be she'd be one um, in the grand scheme of it that I'd be probably speechless. Yeah. But but the other two, they live in my lane. They live in my world of entertainment. Um, and I watch. I stay them. And I think 
they do just such a masterful job at being them. So, yeah. 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 What is your post COVID trip? Your first post COVID trip, if you've not already taken one, but what is your, where are you going? Well, I've got a list, right? I want to go to Maldives and um, I want to go to Singapore, but like our immediate post COVID trip, I think we're about to go to Puerto Rico here soon. So myself and my team, we're going to hop a flight and just, Come on. you know, work and play a little bit, you know, um, sometimes as a creative, you got to get into a space that allows you to create. So I think we've been talking about Puerto Rico a lot. I think we've, we've decided on that, okay. but but those other spots are very much on my list for, for probably 2022. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to your car. What is playing when the car cuts on? Oh, right now, Yahweh by um, All Nations and yeah. uh, Chandler Moore. Yeah. That song, I don't know, man. It has hit me in my gut. I listen to a lot of gospel music. And let me tell you why. It's not because I'm so anything. Um, but I firmly believe what goes in you is what comes out of you. Um, you know, the Bible tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And listen, I am a writer. I'm a creator. And just as much as I can create and heal with my words, I know I can do the opposite with the things that I say, the things that I write, the things that I create. So I'm very intentional about what I listen to, what I watch, my ear gate, my eye gate, because it, those things begin to take root. And I tell my team all the time, whatever's in you comes out of you at two times at your peak when you're doing well and at your lowest, when, when pressure mounts, when life comes upon you, what's in you is going to come out. of you. So, and then when you get to your mountaintop, there's a freedom. So what's in you is what comes out of you. So for me, I listen to worship music 98% of the time. Like every once in a while when I feel like I'll, I'll put Cardi on or, or Jay-Z. Come on. But, but for the most part, I listen to worship music just because of what it allows my, it, it allows my spirit to, to stay calm. And it allows me just to feed myself the right things throughout the day. Um, so right now, y'all what that song, man, it's like I hear it in my sleep. It's it's that's what's playing right now at this time. Yeah, Yahweh, it's a it's a it's a great song. It is. Man, listen, if you're a worshiper, oh, it'll lay it'll yeah. lay you out real good. No, I always <laughs> tell people that before anything, I'm a worshiper. I tell people that all the time. Before yeah. anything, before yeah. any other things you want to call me or anything else you want to say, that yeah, yeah. And, and the hard thing for me is I can't go into it and come out of it. Like I can't. Yeah. Like once I'm no, in, it's a, not a. Like yeah. I can't, it's even hard for me a lot of times before I get up oftentimes, it depending on whatever song that we're doing. Once I lock in, it's hard for me to come it's out of over. It. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. So. <laughs> I know. I know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You're not going to take me there today. So okay, uh, okay. <laughs> two more things. One, tell me of a time where you laughed at the most inappropriate time. Oh my gosh. Um, with my, my cousins and I talk all the time. You know, that there's a meme going around like if we're ever in a don't or don't laugh moment, don't look at me. And I feel like my family is the, the poster child for that. And um, I can't even remember all the details surrounding it, but we were, um, I think my uncle had passed. Um, this is a couple of years ago, but I think my uncle had passed and all of my cousins, we were all sitting together and we were in the funeral, just done. And I mean, I mean, like we had, we had cried and all this stuff and I don't know what happened, but when I tell you the whole, the whole row, and then it gets to the point to where now you're laughing at the other people because they can't stop laughing and you, you're no longer laughing at the minor thing. It's, it's the infectiousness of the laugh. And it was so embarrassing. And like, we were all just, and we, to this day, we, to this day say, look, I cannot sit by you or you or you, if we're going to a funeral or, and it was like a close family member. We had literally just been crying and grieving and, and I don't know what, what flipped that switch, but man, it was so inappropriate. It was the most, and the preachers, oh, we, it was so, 
I mean, we were I the best laughs in church. I, Man, I, 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 when I, well, you're not supposed to be. And don't you love it when you got that person in church? And it might be you and just that human who saw the thing. And you look, and then when you, the moment y'all make that eye contact, it's like, yo, it is. <laughs> yeah, we get in trouble for that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and unfortunately, I grew up making fun of so many people, and now I'm on the other side of now. Now you're on the other side of it. <laughs> Kind of happened like that. I'm telling you. It did. Telling you. So wrapping up, we have so many people that are creatives that have been inspired by this conversation um, that want to either go in the lane that you're in or have their own lane. Um, infecting change is, um, you know, what um, your CEO over visionary behind all of that stuff. Like you're not just waiting for change, you're infecting change. Uh, what would you say to all the creatives and all the different people that are trying to stay focused in their lane and stay encouraged and keep climbing, you know, for everybody who's watching right now, what would you, what would you say to them? I tell people this all the time, you know, um, I've done many of these interviews and this is often a similar question is asked as a parting question. And I say this often, um, one of the greatest things that you can really understand when I say get an understanding of it deep within yourself is that you are right where you're supposed to be. I mean, it doesn't matter if your car just got repossessed, because I went through that. doesn't matter if you sleep it in your car, because I went through that. doesn't matter if you're sitting on the edge of the bed right now, crying. It doesn't matter if you're on the mountaintop celebrating. It doesn't matter if you just got another rejection letter. It doesn't matter if you're wondering if you can, if you should, if you heard properly, if you can cast vision, it doesn't matter. You have to really get the understanding that you are right where you're supposed to be. The journey has been predestined for you and everything, good, bad, indifferent, and everything in between has already been orchestrated. That conversation has already been had in heaven about you and your gift and where you're going. And it's okay that you are where you are and you can't superimpose your will on the will of God for your life. You can't make something happen that wasn't already predestined in the, the, the creation of you for God, the will for your life that God did. You can't superimpose it. So really releasing the ultimate control and saying, what is for me has to come to me. And if that was a no, that means I'm right where I'm supposed to be. If that door closed, if that just happened, it was meant this way. So getting that knowledge on the journey of building, getting that revelation on the journey has saved me. Doesn't mean I hadn't cried tears. That doesn't mean I haven't I decided I was quitting, thought I was quitting, didn't think I could. But, but deep inside of me, when I'm able to come back to my common place, it's knowing I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And the next, the next thing is what, it's, what was destined for me, whatever that is. And it may not be, may not get a no, well, that just means a yes is coming. It may be. It may not be true. That may not. Your, your yes may not be the next. It's not always going to be your season. Like it's not always. You know these memes and these posts. They're good. I get it, and it's for somebody. But if it's not for you, that's okay too. So I just had to really understand. You know, and I'm writing this book. I've been writing it for two years, but process. Is the price we pay for the promise. There was a currency exchange in the earth. If you go buy a Coke, you're going to pay for the Coke. Go buy a car, you're going to pay for the car. You go buy a house, you're going to pay for that. In the kingdom, the promises of God are yea and amen. The promises of God are for us. But the currency exchange is process. And that's just, you just, you got to stay relegated and committed to the process. It's the price you have to pay. But if you're willing to stay relegated to it, um, you're gonna see 
some of the most amazing things happen that you can never imagine. So wherever you are, whether you're in the mountain, in the valley, or in the cave, or you're in between, you may be in between jobs, you may not be, whatever that is, I can assure you of this. You are right where you're supposed to be in your process. Your process is going to be your currency exchange for the promise you're seeking. Yeah. Well, y'all heard it first that there's a book coming. Y'all heard it. So that means that since y'all heard it, she's coming back uh, to talk about this book. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. That was, I'd love to. I'd love to. The exchange of this currency will be talking. I'd love, the currency, I'd love to. I've okay. given myself a deadline of the end of 2021 to have the book done. So I guess accountability. I guess we just created some accountability. We did. Because I don't hard. know. I, sh- I shouldn't have said first. that. Can, no, we edit that? Can we edit that part out? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's done. It's, <laughs> it's done. Like establishing the art. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See, see. Uh, well, that is good. Well, let everybody know where we can follow you. Um, of course, there's apps to download. There's um, uh, things you can put on TV to for people to see, uh, websites, follow, um, stock exchanges, um, Bitcoin to buy, all that type of stuff. Let everybody know. I receive uh, all of that. How they can connect with you. Yeah. Um, listen, um, ICTV, Infect and Change Television, is our digital streaming service. Um, We're available on Roku TV, Fire TV, Apple TV, Xbox, all Android and iOS devices. So everywhere that you can find Netflix, Hulu, BET Plus, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, you can find ICTV. Um, We are, we have some of the cutting edge technology, some of the most cutting edge technology I'm really excited about. Um, The relaunch that has happened and uh, we're moving forward with content, a lot of original content, uh, television, uh, films, movie, reality shows, documentaries, concerts. And we're actually launching um, IC Podcast Network um, here soon. So maybe there are some conversations to be had. Um, so podcast, conversations. everything, you know, um, and we, we just want to be on the cutting edge and a leader in media and entertainment. And I believe that over the next few years have, uh, we will have accomplished or be on the way to accomplishing that goal. So um, if it, if you, Facebook, you just type in effect and change tele- television, uh, Instagram is I C television, Twitter is I C television one. Uh, my personal information. If you just type in JP Haynes, uh, on Facebook, you'll find me. If you type in JP Haynes 31 on Instagram, you'll find me. And it's J Page P A I G E 31 on Twitter. So, um, and then the website is www.ictelevision.com. And we just recently launched Black Experience Media, um, BXM. And I wanted to launch this is, uh, for uh, content creators of color. Black creators telling black stories. It's powered by ICTV. Um, so it's short form content, short stories, short documentaries, um, mini podcasts, mini stories. So there's a whole different form of media we're doing over there at BXM. So if you type in Black Experience Media, B L A X Experience Media, you'll find that as well. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, yeah. that's everything I got for right now. Well, I look forward to uh, driving up on the property of um, ICTV and seeing all the different things all on the uh, the landscape and the property. So you pointed this building. That's there. That's there. This is recorded here. All that stuff. So uh, you can't. Oh, have all you, of this. See, you know, man of God, you operating as a man of God right now. I've been. Um, but we'll, let me just put it like this. We'll talk offline, but we're in in we're right in the middle of hopefully hopefully acquiring um and these we just had these conversations so you you know you in the vein always you're in the vein you can't you can't have all of this and it not have a place that's right there is a place you know um and he'll give you a place there there is as we talk about about haters there is a whole place but there is enough room for all of it yeah. So yeah. So there's enough room. So, all right. Thank you for uh, connecting, and um, y'all follow her. Do it right now if you know what's best for you, and if you want to see Jesus, you need to follow her right now. Thank you again for tuning in. Remember to like, subscribe, or even rate this podcast wherever you're listening to it, or comment if you're watching this on YouTube. And remember to share it with whoever you know needs to hear it. Until next time, breathe in. 
be the best version that you can be, everybody else is taken. And remember to embrace your own unique design. I promise you. See you soon.